This is video history from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the history of obstetrics and gynecology in America. And with us on this sunny November morning in 1985 is a founding fellow of the college, Dr. O. L. Parsons of Lawton, Oklahoma. Dr. Parsons, we're glad to have you with us. It's a real honor to be here, sir. Why don't we begin by having you tell us where you were born and where you grew up, but some of those things that seem to shape each of us. I was born in uh, Enid in Oklahoma Territory seven and a half months before Oklahoma became a state. <coughs> and <coughs> excuse me, and uh, Oklahoma has been my home for my entire life. And the first eight years of my life we were, fill, built, were spent on the uh, frontier area of South Central Oklahoma. And then in um, 1915, <coughs> I'm very sorry, 1915 we moved into Lawton, Oklahoma, where I still live, and we moved in a covered wagon. Arrived there, and all of my education was in the Lawton school system to, through high school. Then I attended um, Oklahoma State University for a bachelor's degree in biological science, and then the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine for a medical degree, and I stayed there in Oklahoma City at the, what was then the Wesley, now the Presbyterian Hospital, for my year of rotating internship and uh, two years of um, the part of the specialty of surgery, gynecology and obstetrics, as it was then. And so we we were trained at that time in abdominal surgery along with obstetrics and gynecology. I guess if, if you were born seven months before Oklahoma became a state, you were a genuine sooner, right? To That's right. I was there, really there before your Oklahoma life. became a state. When did you go back to Lawton to practice? In 1934, I opened my practice there and I started like all the others do, did in that time well perhaps a few in the larger cities in that area of the country but most of us started in general practice and then limited our practice in a few years after we got busy enough in our own special field <clears throat> and um, so you, was, you, you actually had to begin by doing general practice then yes that was there were no uh, doctors referring patients and you just started once you got established as the doc other doctors uh, became acquainted with you and trusted your expertise in the special field and then patients and soon then you were having well usually it was a few years that you were having then enough work in your field so that you could limit your practice and and i did that what tell me what the practice of obstetrics was like, and uh, that's 50 years ago now in uh, Lawton. And uh, even in our training at, in university, we did home deliveries on all uh, cases that were not anticipated to be a special, have a special problem. So we had some very unusual experiences. One I remember especially was they told my partner and I, they sent us out with a senior and a junior, and I was the junior that year, and and they told us to go to a certain street and turn down the, it was the road, and about a quarter of a mile from the corner, we would come to a covered wagon where there was a woman in labor. And so we went out there, and the, my partner was a big, real tall, slim, very slender, man and he could only get up in the wagon on his knees and I got under the wagon with my set up my sterile uh, field and and there's light rain going on and under the wagon with me there were two hound dogs and three children and but whenever he wants something I'd hold it up and he'd reach out to uh, get it <laughs> and uh, we were supposed to go back in two days and we always did go back on the second day to, as a postpartum call and when we went back on that second morning the wagon was gone and there, where they cooked their breakfast where the rocks were still warm around the little fireplace they'd made but we didn't hear any more from them and that was in the last few days of August 
at about the 15th of January, I got a Christmas card that was mailed in Phoenix, and they'd made it to Phoenix for Christmas. <laughs> and now you fly to Phoenix in two hours, you know, but then it took them uh, over a fourth of a year. Oh, but uh, many experiences like that in the home deliveries. And so mother and baby did well in the covered way. Yeah, according to the, uh, the father, he said that he wanted to thank us that uh, they'd done real well and they were doing so well and they needed to be on the way, so they didn't wait for us, our postpartum call. What, what were your obstetrical fees uh, back When we then first started in Lawton, uh, home delivery of a second or later baby was $25. If it was the first baby, it was 35 and we were our problem big problem was uh, getting patients to come in for prenatal care up until that time until i was trying and some of the other newer doctors were trying to get patients to come in for prenatal care usually what happened the uh, husband would go to the doctor that's where it was when i was born uh, he went to the doctor gave him a ten dollar bill and that engaged him and he, the doctor said well call me when when you need me, and so after my mother had been in labor for three or four hours, and they were convinced it really was labor, well, then they called the doctor, and that's the only time he saw her was um, at the just at the time of delivery. How long did you do home deliveries in Lawton? Well, in 1937, I wanted to quit before that, but um, in 1937, uh, the hospital that was there before that well, it didn't have any special obstetrical facilities, no delivery room or uh, nursery or anything. And we were able, a few of us young doctors, get a hold of a, barely enough money to buy into the hospital, and we rebuilt it. And then we had a very good delivery room and the nursery and so on, and so... I just announced to my patients that I wouldn't do any more home deliveries. And uh, a few of them tried to make me by waiting until they were in labor and then calling and saying, I won't have time to get to the hospital. But I s soon went through that and uh, we got then where everybody came. Once they did come, of course, they were glad. And um, one of them had had three in the home, oh, said, if, and that was her third one, and uh, delivered in the hospital in the next few years and she said well if i have six more i'm going to be back to the hospital i don't want any more home deliveries but <clears throat> of course a few years ago as you know well they got back from fad where they uh, were having a trying to have home deliveries again but i'm glad to say not very many people took advantage of that so-called new idea and eccentric what uh what were office visit fees like in the 1930s? Uh, I charged um, $5 for the first um, complete examination and then $3 if it included a pelvic examination for subsequent visits. And if it didn't include a pelvic examination, it was $2. Well, times my, have changed. My overhead was about thousand dollars a year and we didn't need any liability insurance because nobody sued anybody then you you had good surgical training what uh, kinds of surgery predominated in your practice back I, uh, in those besides early years? obstetrics and gynecology i did uh, <clears throat> the general abdominal surgery until in the 1950s when we got some well-trained general surgeons in lawton and then i discontinued their part of the work and stayed with mine but I did uh, several colon resections and gastric resections and lots of appendectomies. We had more appendectomies, many more, than we did do now. Every time that we noticed that every time you had a, a period of acute sore throats, what we call strep throat, uh, it would be followed by a good many cases in the next two or three weeks of acute appendicitis. And so Appendectomy is almost eliminated now, but uh, because of the use of the various antibiotics and clearing up the other infections before it spreads to the lymphoid tissue of the appendix, I suppose. But anyway, then uh, appendectomy was 
in my practice was four or five times a week. What what sort of gynecologic surgery uh, well, predominated? We had uh, uh, I did uh, hysterectomies, vaginal and and uh, abdominal. There was one thing though that I think is would be very interesting from a historical standpoint. I know it was once at <clears throat> at a meeting one of our regular college meetings out at Phoenix, I went in to lunch and we were having round table luncheons and uh, some a monitor sat at, the, at each table as we often do as you know and, uh, and led a discussion during the lunchtime and, and there were four young doctors already at this table and men in their early 30s and one of them was saying, you know I saw a patient the other day that had a hysterectomy and uh, and she still had her cervix and said, that's just criminal. And I said, when did she have her hysterectomy? And he said, 1947, why? And I said, in 1947, the difference and the reason we didn't remove the cervix then, if we didn't just absolutely have to, was that you expected a 2% mortality if you left the cervix and a 25% mortality if you remove the cervix. And he said, oh, you don't mean it. And I said, I sure do mean it. I practiced then, and I know, and it was 1950 before we had enough penicillin and, and civilian practice to really begin to use it, much like we do now, only in much smaller doses then. We, we give a patient uh, uh, 100,000 units at <clears throat> a day maybe, and now you give them that much an hour if you want to. Found that it works better and also that it's safer, but um, <clears throat> until we had, until we could tr control pelvic infections, well, we just did not remove the cervix. Of course, of course you can't accept 25% uh, mortality on most of the time an elective procedure if you, if you, well, you, I'd say you couldn't accept it on an elective procedure at all. And so we left the cervix. We combed it out well. And if it, they had a cancer of the stump later, well, we just had to take care of that. But, and that happened a few times in my practice, but not very much, so that we felt that it was much safer to run the risk of a, of a later a cervical cancer of the stump rather than to run the risk of infection subsequent to the hysterectomy in which you opened up the vaginal canal. You mentioned uh, Dr. Parsons keeping up with your education. Uh, it would be interesting for me to ask you over the course of a 50-year practice, uh, how do you keep up? What what kinds of uh, things have you found to be really effective well, I, for yourself? Well, first, I subscribe to uh, uh, some good, what I consider good journals. Uh, and at the time of my graduation and for the next 10 years, and still, uh, still a respectable journal is the SGNO journal and it was the best one for obstetrics and gynecology and abdominal surgery at that time and so I read it, read the um, American Medical's uh, uh, obstetrics and then we got a yearbook then. Uh, maybe they still do have it but the yearbook in obstetrics and gynecology and reading those and attending a few meetings. However, when we first started, the only good meeting that was close enough to, for us to go to very often was the Oklahoma City Clinical Conference. And it started the year I entered medical school. It was a very, very good meeting. <clears throat> but the problem, and that was the problem up until the time of the organization of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, was you'd go to a four-day meeting, and uh, on Tuesday morning, they'd have two hours of obstetrics, and thir Thursday afternoon, they'd have two hours of gynecology, and that's all obstetrics and gynecology there was. The rest of it, of course, was other subjects in which other people who were there were interested, orthopedics and pediatrics and so on. and. This was one of the big, great needs, I think, and uh, and uh, membership growth that uh, colleges had, I think, demonstrates how much it was needed because uh, 
we can go and spend four days now, and it's all obstetrics and gynecology. In fact, <clears throat> with the, and I think this is one of the things that I've been so proud of, of our organization, is how well they've served not only the patients, but also the doctors in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. We have this tape update, which started several years ago. This is the 10th year, I believe, of it. And uh, you could get 36 cognates, credits, uh, in a year before you were shaving or some other way yes. that you could listen to your tapes. And, and that was very important because it's otherwise you spend $1,500 or $2,000 and miss a week of practice. And uh, so I, I think these are some of the things that's, that's been outstanding in, in the college's services to both to its members and also uh, most especially to the, to the women patients of America. Must have, uh, when you started practice, even been a fairly good trip to get to Oklahoma City, wasn't it? Yes, it was, because uh, the pay, it was about 18 miles of paving between Lawton and Oklahoma City then. <laughs> and if you, if you got, got there at a rainy season, where you might be up there three or four days because you, you couldn't get through the mud to get home. And, um, of course, now you think nothing of going off to, London or somewhere for a medical meeting, but then travel of any kind or any distance was was a was a problem, and that's one reason why we were trained in, in surgery, abdominal surgery, because we might be uh, the only doctor in 80 miles who could uh, or was qualified really to open the abdomen, and. No way that to get the patient to the doctor, specialist in Oklahoma City, or get the specialist to you and to your patient. And so we were trained just, if we found a problem, we just dealt with it right there because that was the right time to do it and also about the only way you could do it. What are, would you say, are some of the major changes that you've seen in practice, say, perhaps both in obstetrics and uh, also in gynecology. Well, I think that uh, the, of course, the, the focus on uh, maternal and infant welfare, we don't like to use the word welfare because of its connotation that we have nowadays of, um, of a well, method of payment rather than a, than a well-being, but the well-being of the mother and the infant, and of course our goal is a, a, a healthy and undamaged mother and a, and a well and healthy and lusty baby that will grow and do well, and that's been our goal always, and there have been so many updates though in, um, in knowledge first. I know uh, at the time I uh, was doing those home deliveries that one of the the great uh, functions of the father at that time was immediately take the placenta out and bury it uh, before the kids saw it and before the dogs found out where it was. And and that's really about all we knew about the, that they taught her, that we knew particularly about the, the placenta. Well, then about five years ago at Memphis, I attended a two-and-a-half-day meeting on, on the placenta, and some of my co- physicians at home said, what in the world did they talk about the placenta for two and a half days? I said, you can't, you can't believe all they know about it now. And uh, so I gave a few talks around uh, to medical or even to interested uh, uh, paramedical and so on groups about the placenta, the marvelous bridge between two generations because of all the chemical uh, uh, changes that the placenta even produces and there is a thing that's a it's this explosion of knowledge that, that has made us more effective I think in dealing with all these things uh, problems that, that affected both the mother and the baby and then in the in the gynecology the, the great advances and um, and understanding functional changes I think uh, 
especially research in cellular biology, has really opened up a better, so much better understanding in all fields of medicine, but in ours, about the effects of um, of the hormones on producing ovarian function and so on. And uh, it's always been a mystery and a more or less of a, a source of intense interest, I'm sure, is why only one uh, oocyte develops each month and in alternate ovaries if there are two ovaries. And understanding the intracellular biology has really opened up that field so much. And also, perhaps, uh, getting a more, um, at least more thought uh, directed towards a control of um, cancer and other diseases at the at the cellular level. Sounds to me as if you're right up to date. Are, are you still practicing? Dr. Well, I, re I retired a year ago after 51 years of practice. How many babies did you deliver? Or did you stop to count? Well, they had me count them up, and 7,500. And I want to say too that I enjoyed the last one. Was just as thrilled with it as I was with my first one in 1931. Oh, well, you must have lots of children of children in there, don't well, you? Well, you know, now I go so many places, and somebody will come up to me and say, "You probably don't remember, but 41 years ago today, you delivered me." <laughs> and uh, and you say you probably don't. <laughs> uh, I uh, I remember after they mentioned it that I recall, but uh, I. That is a, a lot of babies, and then I had a real large surgical practice too, altogether about 14,000 gynecological procedures, and about 3,000 more, in which I was invited as a consultant, and then asked to scrub in with the doctor and uh, kind of be a standby if he encountered problems that he felt was beyond his training and experience. I suspect there are probably not many people in Lawton, Oklahoma, who don't know you. Well, <laughs> there are hardly anybody that doesn't know me, I guess, down there now. And, uh, and I, at the grocery store and post office and so on, I, I still get uh, kisses on the cheek and say, Oh, doctor, you look well, but we sure do miss you. And uh, going in post office the other day, one of my black lady patients and friends uh, grabbed me and kissed me on the cheek right in the door. The other people walk around and say, oh, I miss you so much. <laughs> of course, it's, uh, I feel greatly honored that they even remember, but uh, because I really enjoyed everything I did in my practice. I never for a moment wanted to trade jobs with anybody. Dr. Parsons, do you have any closing comments you'd like to give us? And Well, I... <clears throat> Uh, take great satisfaction in the fact that I was granted the status of a founding fellow of an organization which I think so rightly too uh, am so proud of because we uh, have taken the lead and the college has uh, great leadership with Dr. Pierce and the others uh, before him and <clears throat> developing uh, such excellent helps for both patients and the doctors our Green Journal has been an outstanding and the top journal in obstetrics and gynecology since the first uh, edition. And I used to, at the earlier meetings, uh, always enjoy Dr. Reese's comment. He was our editor, you know, for a good many years. But it's uh, it still is a, is the top, certainly the top journal published in America. And I got to visit the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology just five years ago and. And I subscribed to their journal for a couple of years after that, and I think ours surpasses theirs, not much, but some. And uh, the extent of the coverage, sometimes even requiring a supplement, you can't get it all in one cover, you'll send us one and a half each uh, as, one, as a monthly uh, edition. Then also the, the particular specialty update cassette series because <clears throat> that's the only one, as I believe, of any of the medical specialties that publishes their own. And it's 
always well worthwhile and and it would be worth it would be uh, I think appreciated and and heard by many of us anyway but then also then there's a is the cognate credit which helps add up to the 50 a year that's recommended but our meetings are are better and better all time I attended one this summer that was at a resort place at Jackson Wyoming and we started at seven in the morning went straight through to with a coffee break but went straight through to one without lunch break then recessed for the day and all had our six hours in then of uh, classroom work for the day and gave it time then for the families the doctor to get with the family and do some of the things like take a float trip down the Snake River and so on also uh, with two doctors putting on the program we became so well acquainted with them and it was a first name relationship with, uh, with these uh, doctors and I think this is, is great but all the meetings we've had the, the national meetings and uh, also we've uh, been a, a very uh, supportive of uh, government programs without uh, necessarily agreeing with all of them but they have come to recognize and also to respect the opinions of the college and and affair, medical affairs that uh, relate to women and babies and so for all those things for the help we get in our updates for the these various uh, handouts and and um, cassette programs that we can use for patient education and all those things i think the college has has uh, made it been the leader and in, in fact of all the medical groups and so that's the reason why I feel honored to be here today and take great pleasure in being and satisfaction of being a founding member. And perhaps I'm here for primarily because I've survived, but because I know most of us are not around anymore. But otherwise, uh, it, it has been a lifelong, or since the life of the college, and most of my practice has been in that period of time, uh, it's been such a great focus for me and, and educational training, inspiration to attend the meetings, meet the, the very high quality people that are in our profession, and, uh, and then to get to share these thoughts with you today. It's a well, real pleasure and a great honor. Dr. Parsons, the college is really nothing more than its fellows make it, so it's, it's our honor and pleasure to have you as a founding fellow here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.